Ah, the sweet, sweet freedom that comes with your first trip to the movie theaters at 13 when you can confidently walk up to the box office and say, no, I do not need my mom to buy a ticket for... What, what, what's in the theaters these days? Probably something Marvel, right? Since everything else is streaming online? And while kids with a laptop and a go get them attitude can watch pretty much whatever the heck they want without parental guidance, the fact remains that movie theaters are technically supposed to screen out patrons who are too young for some of that tantalizing content. But where did these movie ratings come from and what qualifies for each tier? There's murder, mayhem, and First Amendment rights. Up next on Fact Fights. We may not be rated by the Motion Picture Association, but you can give us a rating by hitting the thumbs up button and making sure you subscribe. So film ratings actually start all the way back in the 1890s at the very beginning of film itself. Director Enoch J. Rector filmed the heavyweight boxing championship in March of 1897 between James Corbett and Robert Fitzsimmons, two of the biggest names in boxing at the time. Rector's film is considered the first widescreen, first feature length, and first blockbuster event in cinema history. It is also the first film to be censored for inappropriate content. In comparison to today's standards, the fight was probably pretty tame, but prize fighting was illegal in all but one state in the US. That state being, of course, Nevada. Where would Las Vegas be without its ultimate showdowns? The fight was recorded in its entirety on 63 millimeter film on March 17th and was screening as early as May 22nd that same year. Talk about post-production turnaround time. It would go on to tour the US and the UK for the next year. Now, because the actual sport was illegal outside of Nevada, many government officials thought that screening the film was also illegal. So a lot of state and local governments tried banning it from playing. In addition to the moral outrage of two men fighting each other for money, there was also a concern that women were allowed to attend the theater when they were not allowed to attend boxing matches in person, granting them access to the never before seen spectacle of half naked men punching each other in the face. So essentially this film was rated V for violence, shock, and N for nudity, scandal. But that didn't stop audiences from attending. Some estimates calculate the film netted up to $750,000 in box office profits. Pretty solid for something this action packed, especially when you consider that tickets only cost a nickel. Whew. Look at those hot bods. I might have the vapors. Today's modern rating system has its roots in the Motion Picture Production Code of 1934, or as it's more commonly known, the Hayes Code. The Hayes Code was named after William Hayes, president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, the trade association that controlled most of the studios as well as, at the time, most of the theaters. A lot of you may know that the Hayes Code put strict limits on what could and could not be shown in films distributed to the American public. Things like nudity, strong language, violence, and any sort of sexual anything, really. The Hayes Code was written under the strict eye of the Catholic National Legion of Decency, which meant that if you had to admit to it in confession, you probably couldn't put it in your film. Well, unless the character in question was being punished for cardinal sins, in which case it reminded your viewers not to commit them, and thus promoted a healthy dose of Catholic guilt. What you might not know is that the Hayes Code was actually Hollywood's concession to the federal government to keep them out of the movie business. Early Hollywood had a lot of sex, drugs, and period appropriate rock and roll going on with the occasional murder to really spice things up. So not too different from Hollywood today? Everyone outside of Hollywood, though, found all these goings on to be both shocking and morally offensive. Because art imitates life, a lot of films also contain sex, drugs, and, well, 
no music because the movies were silent, but the piano player at the theater was probably too into jazz for the comfort of conservatives at the time. That's why a lot of state governments set up censorship boards that could ban films from showing if they were deemed inappropriate. If you think that sounds like a violation of your First Amendment right to free speech, you are not the only one. Mutual Film Corp, a film distributor, took the state of Ohio to court in 1915 over this very issue. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court, who ruled 9-0 in favor of the state of Ohio. See, to the Supreme Court, film was not an art. It was a business and therefore not protected under the First Amendment right to free speech. To quote the ruling on the case, the exhibition of moving pictures is a business, pure and simple, originated and conducted for profit like other spectacles and not to be regarded as organs of public opinion within the meaning of freedom of speech and publication guaranteed by the Constitution of Ohio. I mean, in Ohio's defense, I think anybody who goes into film production has the same argument with themselves over whether they're making art or they're making money. Fast forward a few years to the 1920s and Hollywood was rocked by three major scandals between 1920 and 1922. Famous silent screen actress Olive Thomas died from accidentally poisoning herself, though the rumor was that her husband had killed her. Comedian Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle was accused of the rape and murder of actress Virginia Rapay. Fatty was ultimately exonerated, but his career was essentially destroyed. And in 1922, director William Desmond Taylor was murdered, and the resulting investigation turned over quite a lot of scandalous evidence, but no actual murderer. Hollywood had a PR nightmare on their hands, and if they didn't do something fast, they were looking at some serious government restrictions on their creative process. So Hollywood opted to regulate itself, thereby appeasing federal, state, and local governments who sought to monitor, censor, and profit from the distribution of films in their districts. Will Hayes first distributed a list of don'ts and be carefuls in 1927. The list is definitely a product of the time. On the list of don'ts was miscegenation or romantic relations between people of different races, more specifically for 1920s America, romantic relations between white people and black people. To Hollywood's credit, it was largely ignored. So in 1934, Hayes created the Production Code Administration, an office that was responsible for granting certificates of approval to films before they could be distributed. The head of the PCA was a man named Joseph Breen, who saw it as his personal duty to clean up Hollywood. This one man wielded a pretty tight fist over Hollywood for 20 years. If your film didn't receive a certificate from the PCA, it was dead in the water. While some films wouldn't see the light of day, other filmmakers scrambled to recut their pictures to appease Breen and his board. Breen was, by most accounts, an anti-Semitic, anti-communist, incredibly conservative Catholic who could cancel a film for having too much strong language. But by his retirement in 1954, the country was changing dramatically. Attitudes towards censorship had certainly changed, and so had the political and cultural environment. Hollywood too was changing. Thanks to a Supreme Court ruling on United States versus Paramount Pictures Incorporated, the studios were no longer allowed to own the theaters that showed their films. Movie theaters suddenly had the freedom to choose from a wider variety of films that were available, including foreign and independently produced films that were not subject to the PCA. Far from discouraging audiences, Hollywood found that films lacking the PCA certificate of approval had little effect on box office numbers, and threats of boycott actually tended to increase them. In the 50s, the code was reworked to reflect the changing social mores of the time, but it was definitely on its way out. The Supreme Court overturned its earlier ruling on the Ohio case in a new case, Joseph Burston Incorporated versus Wilson, stating, it cannot be doubted that motion pictures are a significant medium for the communication of ideas. The importance of motion pictures as an organ of public opinion is not lessened by the fact that they are designed to entertain as well as to inform. That books, newspapers, and magazines are published and sold for profit does not prevent them from being a form of expression whose liberty is safeguarded by the First Amendment. We fail to see why an operation for profit should have any different effect in the case of motion pictures. Films like like the 1959 Marilyn Monroe vehicle, Some Like It Hot, 
a film that did not receive the PCA seal of approval but packed theaters anyway, chipped away at the code even more. And by the release of 1966's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? It was all but dead. It was helped along by the new president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, now called the Motion Picture Association of America, Jack Valenti. Valenti ultimately put the final nail in the coffin of the production code, freeing up studios and filmmakers to more fully express their ideas without the threat of distribution deals hanging over their productions. With that in mind, though, films still needed a way to let audiences know just how racy they were, so in 68, Jack Valenti came up with the MPAA rating system, and it's pretty close to the one we still use today. There was G for general audience, M for mature audiences, parental discretion advised, R for restricted to audiences 16 years of age or older, unless accompanied by a parent or guardian, and X for films that would not be suitable for anyone under 16, regardless of parental accompaniment. The X was actually a little ambiguous at the time. See, it wasn't a trademarked rating, and since producers were submitting their films voluntarily to be rated by the MPAA, the X was a way to let audiences know that your film was simply unrated. In 1970, the system tweaked itself to G, GP for parental guidance suggested, sometimes accompanied by the phrase, this film contains material, which may not be suitable for pre-teenagers, and the age limit for R and X were both raised to 17. GP got changed to PG in 1972 because they realized that they got it backwards. It's parental guidance, not guidance parental, but it's also Hollywood in the 70s, so I guess we can give them some slack. This held steady until 1984, when Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom hit theaters. See, Spielberg's sequel ruffled some feathers for a number of reasons, but most notably for the fact that the film had been rated PG, when it contained significantly more violence and gross-out gore than the first Indiana Jones movie. Spielberg himself suggested adding a new rating to the system, PG-13, indicating that parents should be strongly cautioned some material may be inappropriate for children under 13. I never saw this film in the theater, but I probably watched it on VHS by the time I was eight, and while I was completely unfazed by watching someone rip a still-beating human heart out of some poor dude's chest, I couldn't eat jello for years because of that monkey brain scene, so can confirm. Very traumatizing. Also, you know, very inaccurate to Indian culture, just so we're getting that out there. And the final change to the rating system was removing the X and replacing it with NC-17. See, because you could self-apply the X rating and because it still wasn't trademarked, it kind of got co-opted by the pornography industry. Yes, that's how we got triple X rated films. If one X meant adults only content, then three Xs meant super adults only content. So the MPAA adopted NC-17, no children under 17 admitted. But what qualifies for each ratings tier? Well, according to the MPA, a G-rated film contains nothing in theme, language, nudity, sex, violence, or other matters that, in the view of the rating board, would offend parents whose younger children view the motion picture. No stronger words are present in G-rated motion pictures, depictions of violence are minimal, no nudity, sex scenes, or drug use are present in the motion picture. A PG-rated film contains some profanity and some depictions of violence or brief nudity, but these elements are not deemed so intense as to require that parents be strongly cautioned beyond the suggestion of parental guidance. There is no drug use content in a PG-rated motion picture. A PG-13 film is where it gets complicated. The theme of the motion picture by itself will not result in a rating greater than PG-13, although depictions of activities related to a mature theme may result in a restricted rating for the motion picture. Any drug use will initially require at least a PG-13 rating. More than brief nudity will require at least a PG-13 rating, but such nudity in a PG-13 rated motion picture generally will not be sexually oriented. There may be depictions of violence in a PG-13 movie, Movie, but generally not both realistic and extreme or persistent violence. A motion picture's single use of one of the harsher sexually derived words, though only as an expletive, initially requires at least a PG-13 rating. More than one such expletive requires an R rating, as must even one of those words used in a sexual content. An R-rated film may include adult themes, adult activity, hard language, intense or persistent violence, sexually oriented nudity, 
drug abuse, or other elements so that parents are counseled to take this rating very seriously. And in the Anything Goes NC-17 film, no children will be admitted. NC-17 does not mean obscene or pornographic in the common or legal meaning of those words and should not be construed as a negative judgment in any sense. The rating simply signals that the content is appropriate only for an adult audience. Ratings themselves are determined by the Classification and Rating Administration, or CARA, a branch of the Motion Picture Association. This is a board of parents who have no other affiliation with the entertainment industry. While the leadership of the board and senior raters are made public to the producers and distributors of the films being rated, the identity of a majority of raters are kept secret to protect them from, quote, pressure from members of the public and producers and distributors of motion pictures with respect to the rating of individual motion pictures. Who knew rating a film could be so intense you'd have to protect your identity? Probably because while the list we just outlined seems like a pretty solid set of guidelines, they're actually pretty subjective. I mean, what qualifies as extreme violence or hard language? Yeah, the Academy Award winning film The King's Speech technically used a lot of f-bombs, none of them were used in a sexual context. So do they really count towards the film's R rating? So that's how we got the rating system we have today. Do they still carry the same weight now that we can stream everything online? Got a film that has a rating that makes no sense. Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.